Funding for the production of Dave Tatsuno Movies and Memories has been provided by the Henry and Tomoe Takahashi Charitable Foundation and the members of KTEH. Friend, husband, father, businessman. That's how Dave Tatsuno used to describe himself, but he was much more. Dave was a true Renaissance man, interested in a huge variety of subjects and issues. One of his passions was amateur filmmaking, recording the experiences of his family with his home movie camera. One of those home movies was Topaz Memories. It was the only full color film shot by a resident about life in the World War II Japanese American imprisonment camps. This is the dusty and arid desert of Topaz, Utah. And here you see some of the barracks, rows and rows of barracks. It has the distinction of being one of only two home movies the Library of Congress has placed in its National Film Registry, the other being Zapruder's footage of President Kennedy's assassination. When Dave passed away in January of 2006, he was honored not only by the Japanese American community, but by the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the United States Senate, to name just a few. I had the pleasure of interviewing Dave several times during my career about his family's experiences in the camps and about his film, Topaz Memories. The most telling shot of my Topaz movie is my brother coming in to visit us in his army uniform. He had to come through an American guard and visit the family behind the barbed wire. What a travesty. Tonight, you'll meet Dave and through interviews with his family, archival footage, as well as the last interview I did with him in 2002, you will learn about this inspiring individual and, in his own words, hear his amazing life's journey. My name is Dave Masaharu Tatsuno, and born twice, <laughs> once in Japan and once in San Francisco, which is quite a mystery, which should be explained. Uh, that's a little difficult to explain, even for Dad. Uh, he did have a birth certificate from San Francisco. There's also a picture of him as a babe in arms in his mother's arms, and she's on the boat, coming. So, even when I talked to Social Security, they had two different dates for him. March 31st, 1913, as we celebrated, and August 18, 1913. So, take your pick. How did that get confused like that? We're really not sure. Not sure. He was never quite sure. It's, it's similar to his name, too. Uh, people oftentimes try to call him David M. Tatsuno, David Masaharu, but his name really was Masaharu Tatsuno. And when he was running for class president, Hamilton Junior High School, his, his campaign manager told him, your name is too long, you gotta shorten it. So my dad said, okay, I'll come back tomorrow and, and tell you. He went home and he practiced. Leroy, John, you know, all these different names. And he came across Dave, and he says, Dave Tatsuno, that's good, all right. So he went, next morning he went back and he told his friend, and he says, okay, it's Dave Tatsuno. You said that your father had no f family life as a boy because of his parents' separation. Explain how that came about. Um, our grandmother, which we never knew, was quite a bit younger than our grandfather, and she was not a stay-at-home mom. She was an entrepreneur before her time. She started a sewing school and had quite a few students. She later left, went to Japan, and opened a huge school, sewing school. 
and I've seen pictures of her on stage where she's dressed in furs and she looks like an Auntie Mae. So dad grew up without a mother and that's how the Y became so important to him. YMCA. The YMCA, Japantown YMCA, took him under his wing and mentored him. My grandmother left the family, right? She went back to Japan, took the oldest daughter back. And so they were a motherless family. In the Japanese community, you did not divorce. So it was a real shame on the family. And my grandfather went to Japan sometimes for like five or six months. And so there was just my father and did two kids he had to take care of. And they used to actually accept money and, uh, or food on credit because they had no money. And there's always that very, very dark feeling of being rejected and, or abandoned as a child. And very lonely, because he was a very lonely young man, because there was nobody really to help him. And that's why the YMCA became his family. During his college years, he helped arrange the Young People's Christian Conferences, which were Bay Area-wide conferences, where uh, people would come from all the different Japanese churches and young people. And that's actually how he met Mom. She was serving as one of the registrars at one of the conferences. And Dad, as he always did, sent thank you notes to maybe the 12 ladies who were helping. And Mom was the only one who said a thank you for allowing her to help. And her first, her first uh, letter too, she says, may I call you Dave? My father and mother were be courting each other over a period of four years while the Bay Bridge was being built between San Francisco and Oakland. And it went up while my father was going to Cal. And during the four years, he used to write love letters to my mother and she wrote love letters back. And he loved Yeats, Cates, and all the British poets. And so even now we have an album with all their love letters in chronological order. And I went through them for many years. I used to read them. But my father would write this beautiful flowery uh, love letter with poetry in there, and my mother would respond. And that went on for four years. Now very few Nisei had that kind of very romantic, poetic, philosophical kind of relationship. In fact, after my parents died, now, uh, one of the Nisei women in the Bay Area came up to me. She said, you know what? <clears throat> they were our model Nisei couple. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you have to remember that many of the Issei wanted us to marry properly and take over the family business or whatever. And this notion of romantic love was a little bit too radical for the Issei sometimes. So when you might, my parents fell in love with purely a romantic relationship. And she said, all the younger Nisei couples used to look up to them and say, Oh, we really want a romantic relationship like Dave and Alice. After I finished Cal in December of 36, in January of 37, I took over my dad's store and was running it. What kind of a store was it? It was, well, what you call a dry goods store with uh, all the clothing, Levi's, all the uh, American goods. Actually, you know, I want to go into the diplomatic service but I was the oldest son, and so naturally I had to stay with the store. This is the headline in the San Francisco Chronicle the day after Pearl Harbor, December the 8th, 1941. And then comes the order to evacuate. What did you have to do to prepare? Well, uh, naturally we had to get rid of the merchandise. So we started having a sale and you know it was uh, quite uh, hectic because we didn't know when we were to be evacuated. So we were cutting the prices and trying to get rid of the merchandise. But it was very hectic. Sheldon, their first born son, was two when they left home for the Tanfran racetrack, which was the assembly center in South San Francisco. So she left with a toddler, but she was also fully nine months pregnant. She had no idea where she was going, how long she was going to be gone, or if she was ever going to return to her home. And subsequently, Rod was born at Tanfran racetrack. So the sort of the family joke, inside joke, was when children used to leave the back door open, they'd say, what, were you born in a barn? Well, frankly, he may not have exactly been born in a barn, 
what it was at the racetracks. By that time, like my dad, he was retired. He was nearing 80, and so most of the East Says or the older generation were in their 70s and 80s, and they were ready to retire. He was philosophic from the very beginning, even during the time of the evacuation. Uh, at that time, back in 42, he said uh, we should take the evacuation as a great adventure. That's what he said. And so, and I, and I remember sitting down in April of 1942 and writing my thoughts. And one of the thoughts that I had was that no matter what happens, we make the best of it. You see, uh, in triumph or disaster, treat those two impostors just the same. And you know, that made a difference. Uh, I could have gone to camp and said, oh, they kicked us around, they kicked us out of our house. I would have been bitter, you know, everything negative. No, it is better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. So I followed that, and boy, that made a difference. I ended up, <laughs> teaching Sunday school. I ended up teaching public speaking. I ended up running a store. I ended up by running uh, 20,000 miles outside the camp, buying for the store, and start a YMCA. I mean, accentuate the positive. And so that, my life was rather different from the average evacuee. And now we're here at the Topaz Utah WRA Relocation Center. This is the dusty and arid desert of Topaz, Utah, 156 miles south of Salt Lake City in the Sevier Desert. And here you see some of the barracks, rows and rows of barracks. This is a scene of the dry goods store in Block 12 in the Topaz camp. Tell me about the, the, the store in the camp that, yeah. that you managed. Uh, you see, all the camps had a cooperative a system and had a barber shop, beauty parlor, a canteen, a dragon's division, uh, ran a movie, uh, enterprise in camp. It was a cooperative. So I was asked to be the manager of the co-op dry goods store. Now, other people incarcerated for three years behind barbed wire. And the reason why I was asked to go out to buy if we had stayed in our office and wrote purchase orders, they would get in and say, hey, what's this? From some camp out in the west there. We don't have enough merchandise to give them. So they said, Dave, you have to go out and try to find merchandise. So the, the military authorities who were in charge of the camp allowed you to leave the camp oh, right, right. and travel around the country right. buying things buying. for your store. Right, I was cleared for that. But you were in the camp because presumably you were a threat to national security. That's right. That's and right. yet you were allowed to travel around the that country. That's right. Month. I traveled 20,000 miles. Running around Chicago, St. Louis, Denver, Kansas City, and even New York, I had only one unpleasant experience. Only one. And that was by a a man working in a yachty shop in Chicago who looked like Hitler, with a Hitler mustache. And he was berating the Japanese Americans. And I said, guy, you look like Hitler. And he's talking bad against us, you know? But that's my experience. And I'm on the train with all the armed forces, you know, soldiers and sailors. They're fighting the Japs. And uh, I tell them, I'm a Japanese American, but I'm behind barbed wire. And they felt sorry for me, and I'm trying to go back east and buy some hard-to-get goods. And they said, oh yeah, you're in camp? You're a citizen? They felt very sorry for me. I had no unpleasant experience, but I had lots of good experiences. It's the way you pe treat people. All of life, it's the way you treat people. And as I said, those people became my friends. You had a camera during the war and during your time in the camp, which you used to take pictures. Um, that was very unusual, wasn't it, to have a camera because it, it was illegal uh, to have a camera? Uh, oh, How did you manage uh, all that? Well, very interesting. Right after Pearl Harbor, the evacuees had to turn in the contraband articles like cameras, samurai sword, guns, and shortwave radio. I had a good friend in Oakland, 
And I said to this fellow, Lee Mullis, I said, hey, Lee, I want to lend you my movie camera and the still camera for the duration. Use it. If I don't have it, I can't turn it into the police department. So he had it. Then what happened? One day we're out in the desert, and I'm standing next to a fellow named Walter Hundrick, the supervisor for the government for the cooperative stores. And he suddenly whips out an 8 millimeter camera and takes a shot. And I said, gee, Walt, I give my right arm to have my camera here now. He said, Dave, where is your camera? And I told him. He turned to me and said, write to your friend and have him send the camera to me, to him. Two, three weeks later, he comes to my barrack with the camera and said, Dave, here's a camera. Be careful. Don't take it near the fence where the guards are. You got the, your camera in the camp, but you had no film. That's right. So I assume the buying trips sort of took care of that That's problem. It. You see, here I'm in Chicago. Bass Camera Company is a large camera outfit in Chicago. I would walk in there, and you see, in Chicago, there were very few Japanese Americans uh, running around. And then, you know, back east, they didn't know about the evacuation. So I would walk into that camera store, and they'll sell me three or four rolls of colored film. So you got the film, you got your camera in the camp, right. and you're using your camera to take pictures of life right. at Topaz. You were, you were still breaking the law, were you not? Oh, yes. Oh, weren't, yes. You, weren't you afraid of getting caught? Well, <laughs> the camera was given to me by this government man, uh, Walter Hendrick. And, uh, of course, I would have been in great trouble if I was caught. But, you see, we didn't camp. No guards are inside the camp. So the people were all evacuees. People say, gee, they don't look like they're suffering. Why should they? When they stand in front of the camera, they smile. Were you trying to say something with the kinds of shots you took? I was not trying to say anything except it was a hobby. In other words, this fellow Walter Hendrick had a camera as a hobby. So he figured, gee, I like to take pictures of my kids and family, all that. So that's the reason he got the camera for me. So I, it's not a documentary. I, I've said that because I was just merely taking uh, family shots and people smiling and uh, you know, making mochi, mochizuki, digging ditches, and uh, Sunday school class, uh, my public speaking class that I taught. Uh, it was purely a hobby, that's all. Nothing for the future. But now... And now you see the typical block with the latrine, the laundry, and the 12 barracks on either side, and in the center was the laundry, the latrine, and the dining hall, or the mess hall, as you might call it. This is a couple who met in camp and were married. They now live in Berkeley, California. Bill, Fujita, and Dorothy. And this little young man, Dickie Tani, and dad, Henry Tani, who was a Stanford graduate, very active in the educational field, and his Mrs. Rosie Tani. Rosie now lives in Lombard, Illinois. And this is an interesting shot of the co-op dry goods store. All the people heard that we had some very difficult to get merchandise on our buying trip back east. And they're all waiting for the store to open so that they can get their hand on some of the hard to get merchandise. It is not a sale. Here is the picture of a, the staff, 17 young ladies and four men who staffed the Topaz Consumer Cooperative Dry Goods Store. And this is a picture of the sunrise and not a sunset. We had beautiful sunrise and sunset in, in the desert. A shot of the Topaz Protestant Sunday School in Block Dining Hall 32, a promotion Sunday. Church services were held every Sunday among the Protestants, the Buddhists, and the Protestants held theirs in Dining Hall 32, in Block 32. Reverend Joseph Tsukamoto, one of the church pastors, This is the picture of a group of people who came on the exchange from Tule Lake. 
Some of those who left Topaz went to Tui Lake, and those that uh, de declared their loyalty came to Topaz. This is a shot of the evacuees doing a volunteer work of repairing the pipes which broke. They had used such poor material that the pipes used to break, and we had a volunteer work crew repair the pipes. And that's what they're doing. It's not a chain gang. This is in Block 41, our block. If we didn't have anything else, we had the beauty of the sunsets in the desert of Utah and Topaz, even behind the barbed wires. And th these two girls are of Japanese and Italian ancestry. And if you had one eighth Japanese blood, you had to go to camp. Some of the evacuees cleaning the chimneys and the mess hall. Thanksgiving, 1943. This is the mess hall, it says for Block 41 residents only. And this is the mess hall staff, the crew, and the kitchen waitresses. And the call to dinner, December 1943. And we have some snow in Topaz. Not too often, but we did have some snow, and it became very cold. A wintry day in the desert of Utah. My brother-in-law pulling little David Fujita and Sheldon, our son, And here's a shot of uh, Bill Fujita leaving on relocation to Philadelphia. You can see how cold it was in Topaz. And all we had were the army potbelly stoves. Most of the people who were in Topaz were from the Bay Area, so they were not quite used to the weather. This is uh, my father sweeping. And you know, the East say the older generation like to keep things clean. So there he is, sweeping away. Some winter scenes. You see, uh, my father is still sweeping. <laughs> my father is taking our son, Sheldon, for a walk. Granddad and grandson. Early in the morning, and a snowy morning. And now we're having the traditional Japanese mochitsuki, making of mochi cakes. The sweet rice is steamed first, and then uh, pounded by the mallet. And then it's brought in and made into, cut into little cakes, and there they are. Dawn and Topaz. This is the hospital building. And the Topaz post office. Then I got on top of the roof to take a shot of the sea of roofs. And as you look at this picture, you will realize what a waste it was for the government to spend $300 million building 10 camps like this at $1942. And this is a shot of an evacuee family 
The young man later became, graduated from the University of California and became an architect. And for Boys Festival, they were so proud of their son that they flew the traditional cops. And our daughter Arlene, born in Topaz, now six months old. And then my brother, Tut, came into camp to visit us. He was on his way to Germany to replace the 442 combat team, but the war ended, so he went to Japan with the counterintelligence corps. <laughs> this is a shot uh, hanging up diapers in camp. No laundries. This was taken inside a classroom. Naturally, the film was at that time not very good, and the light was very poor. But I'm teaching public speaking to a group of high school seniors. And I taught a five class of high school seniors public speaking. And this was my smallest class. The largest class had uh, 36 uh, young people. A picture of the Topaz High Y Club of the YMCA we formed in camp. The interesting thing about this picture is that in spite of the fact that they're in the middle of the desert, they're all dressed up in their sport coat, shirt and ties. And right on the very right hand side is Emil Sakharak, who was advisor to the club. And here we have the dust storm. This was taken on a warm Sunday afternoon, and everyone had to keep their windows closed, shut tight. And it was very hot, no air conditioning, and the wind blew, and the dust blew, and the dust would come inside the cracks in the windows and the doors. Hot, dry, and dusty. And this is the way the ground looked, very arid. And it blew and blew. And you stay cooped up inside your barrack. In your movie, I notice you have lots of sh different shots of sunsets. Uh, does that have some meaning for you? Well, uh, not really, not a meaning, but uh, the beauty. Here we're behind Bob Wire. And here you can take the beautiful sun sunset. And uh, again, you know, you're a movie man, you like to take beautiful shots. And so that's the reason I took it. Uh, but I think uh, there's a story there too, that here we have lack of freedom, and yet there you see freedom. That most telling shot of my Topaz movie is my brother coming in to visit us in his army uniform. He had to come through an American guard to visit his family. And so when you see him with the family in his uniform, carrying my daughter Arlene, what a travesty to think that he had to come through <laughs> to and visit the family behind the barbed wire. Family behind the barbed wire while he was out defending the country. Yeah, right. They have now announced that the coast is reopened to the evacuees from January the 15th of 1945. And so this is the leave taking of the evacuees going back to their homes. And naturally those who had homes to go back to were the first ones who were able to leave Topaz and they're leaving Topaz in this fashion. They get on the bus for the 16 mile trip to the town of Delta. And after they leave, all the people who are left behind, they feel quite forlorn and they have to go back to their barracks. When will they be allowed to leave or when can they leave? Where can they go to? Well, we were lucky in the sense that we had our own, pro <laughs> I don't know how we managed it, but our family went uh, not with a group, but just a family. And we took the regular train. And we have uh, movie shots taken at that time. 
And then we stayed overnight in Salt Lake City and then got back to San Francisco. It was a beautiful afternoon, I remember. It seemed that I had never left San Francisco. Immediately after I came back, I worked uh, or uh, served with the, the churches in helping the evacuees return to San Francisco. And I did that for eight months. And I met all the trains coming in. I ran a hostel. I took, uh, I gave uh, talks at the University of California, at San Francisco State College, and helped people with employment. Uh, I was really busy. And another thing, after I got back, I didn't meet with a single unpleasant experience. Everybody was so sorry for the evacuation. They went out of the ways to be nice to you. We had a store on the corner of Post and Buchanan, a lot of large store, but we didn't own the building. So when we got back, we can't get in. But the Japanese contractor that I knew, Mr. Honda, said, uh, Mr. Tatsuno, you own a three-story building next to that corner building. Why don't you jack up the whole house and put a store underneath? I said, can you do that? Oh, yeah, very easy. How much will it cost? Oh, probably about $2,000. Well, it finally cost 6000 but even then, it was worth it because then we didn't have any more rent to pay. And so we lived upstairs while the house was being jacked up to, get, to make the garage a store. And that's how we opened on July the 15th of 1946, the store in San Francisco. The reason why we came to San Jose was rather a sad one. We opened the San Francisco store on July the 15th of 1946. In the summer of 47, we took our oldest son, Sheldon, for a tonsillectomy, and he passed away from our anesthetics. San Jose to get away from San Francisco and to open the store in July of 48. So I say we had flowers in the middle of July 46, July 47, and July 48. Three years in a row we had flowers given to us. And he passed away from a routine tonsillectomy, anesthetics death. It really was quite a blow. times I talked to your dad, spare the light a candle and curse the darkness. Yeah. He said that to me so many times. Yeah. In fact, I mean, th I think that illustrates this tremendous positive outlook he had yeah. on life. Yeah. Tell me about that quality of his. I mean, I was really close to him because, you know, I, my name is Sheridan. I was named after Sheldon, okay? And, um, you know, he had a very, very positive, optimistic public face. But in the back, you know, there's this really dark side, which was sad. And uh, I always felt that he was always kind of very lonely. I think 
And it was. It was the depression, the war, being abandoned when he was young, um, losing my older brother. All those things were such shocks to him. You know, it just, I mean, he used to tell me, he said, I think the hardest, because he said it several times, he said, um, America turned its back on us during the war, right? They rejected us because you're Japanese, right? But there was the echo of my mother turned her back on us when I was a child. So imagine the two things that are most important to a human being, right? Your parents, your mother in particular, and your motherland, both turning your back on you. It must have been hard for my father. I, you know, he mentioned it several times. And I think that's where, you know, just light a candle, that's the back story behind it, is that so much of it was so dark. Some people think they had charmed lives. They had charmed lives in some sense, but they did have tragedies too. But their way of looking at life, especially once we lost our oldest brother in the tonsil operation, Dad said after that they lived with one foot in heaven. And so you're going through life once, why not live it and live it to the fullest? And why don't you share with other people? After we lost our son, they asked me to be the chairman of the Youth Work Committee at the San Jose YMCA. And I felt very humble about it. And finally I said, I would let, like to dedicate my service to youth as a living memorial to my son. God works in mysterious ways as wonders to perform. I ended up by flying a quarter of a million miles for the YMCA. I was at the World Meeting in Geneva, Switzerland in 61. In 65, I was at the World Meeting in Japan. I flew a number of times back east to the National Council of Meetings. Now it's been an international committee, and uh, so I was really kept busy. A quarter of a million miles. I didn't ask for it. I didn't seek it. But they said, Dave, you come and you go for us to the world meeting. You go to this National Council meeting. See, and I became president of the YMCA for five states. Dad was involved in so many things. Dad was active. He didn't know how to just sit and do nothing. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was a doer. And now, 10 years later, in August of 1955, we went back to Utah, to Delta, and then back to the desert. Your family went back to Topaz in 1955, mm -hmm. and then again later. Um, what were those trips like? Um, hot, dusty mosquitoes. And uh, it was eerie. There was a silence sort of that was prevailing over the place, and then we found the barracks, the stone barracks. The laundry tub holder where I used to wash the diapers in Block 41, nothing but memories. For my parents, it was hard because um, all the memories of people who had passed on since, especially these say. When we were walking around, you won't believe this, we finally found, we went to Block 41 and we were kicking around and then my sister found this little tinker toy. And she held it up and she brought it over and she says, Mom, Dad, look at this. My mom burst out crying. My dad got very, very depressed. And I said, well, what's going on? And he said, 10 years ago, when we left the camps, Sheldon had dropped this tinker toy on the ground somewhere. And he had to rush to the buses. And he was crying, saying, I have to go get my tinker toy. He said, we don't have time. 
And so all the way, he was crying that he'd lost his Tinker Toy. And my mom says, this is the Tinker Toy. 10 years later. Yeah, and it was pretty hard. It was really emotionally hard for her. And she, we, I remember when she was crying so hard. And not, I think the camp for her was hard, you know, in general. It was hard for all the Issei and Issei. Um, but to find that Tinker Toy, it's just like, boom, fast, you know, flashback. And it's immediately there and suddenly the loss of your, your oldest son, oldest son, and all your friends since then, right? It's kind of pretty traumatic. I remember that one. That was, that was hard. And our daughter Arlene, who was a little baby there, 10 years before, now 10 years old. For us to go back and see, even though uh, the barracks were no longer there, the buildings were, weren't there, just to see where they had been, what things were possibly like, we got to see the sunset. And to finally say farewell to us, the beautiful Topaz sunset. Farewell, Topaz. Farewell. Just to know that this was there, we were here, and now it's all gone, and life goes on. What are you going to do with it? As you know, my hobby is rather unusual. I'm a diver. Uh, I started the uh, diving program at the San Jose YMCA in February of 1959, and we ended up by training 6,000 divers without a single accident. I'm not a teacher, but I got the course started, and I enrolled in that first class and became a diver in spring of 59, and I've been diving ever since. You people should look up my scuba shots. I think it was either the first or second time I met your father and interviewed him. He mentioned that he'd just come back from scuba diving or shooting underwater pictures, and he was in his mid-80s. He had this sense of adventure, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Which went on right to the end. He was a type A personality. I mean, high energy, go for it, do it. I mean, all our family, in fact, is pretty outgoing. Um, and, and sports-minded, and we all go skiing, scuba diving, I'm a surfer, you know, we run. So we're very physically attuned, we're out there in touch with our bodies and, and nature. The funny thing is, one of the last times I went to church, um, the minister looked at me and said, oh, you haven't been coming to church? I said, no, um, I've been with my dad. And he goes, oh yeah? And dad says, where have you been? I said, every, every weekend I've been with you, at the beach with the RV and the trailer. And that's been my spiritual grounding through dad. And that's one of the nicest things he gave us as a father, the trips to the beach where materialism didn't count. It was God and nature. So my cathedral is at the sea, by the side of the sea. Imagine being a shopkeeper all day. It's pretty boring, you know, sitting behind a counter all day. He used to tell me, sometimes he would just stew beautiful day, gorgeous weather, and he's sitting behind his counter all day. He said, you've got to get out. And I know he would always, um, on weekends, take the family out to Golden Gate Park. So when he had a chance, 1957, when Jacques Cousteau did The Silent World, he and my uh, brother saw it and were totally stunned. So he says, got to get a scuba diving equipment. So he went running up to San Francisco, got a Voigt tank. We were the only divers in Monterey back in 58, I mean, there'd be like 200 people around us because they'd never seen divers. And my dad was really proud about it because he said, yeah, we're explorers, just like Jacques Cousteau. And we'd be diving all over the place. And there's two things I remember, it was watching Topaz movies and scuba diving with my dad. When you were growing up? When I was growing up, that's how I remember it. Every time the guests came over, he'd bring out Topaz movies. Every, every weekend goes, let's go diving in Monterey. Dad had that zest for life and it's, he just, wanted to explore. Dad went parasailing. 
he went up in the plane when our son went skydiving for the first time. Dad wanted to film him as he went down. He went up on a glider up over Sun Valley, Idaho. He dove with the sharks, with the rays, with groupers, you name it. He was down there and he was enjoying, totally enjoying himself. Every minute of it. Every minute, absolutely every minute. He dove till he was 89. Your brother Rod carried the Olympic torch yes. in 2002. What was the significance of that to the family? That was very special. Uh, his son had actually nominated him based on the fact that he was a single parent and had done a very good job, as Ojichan had years previously. And also that he would be running as a free man, helping take this Olympic torch back to the state where for the first three years of his life, he was behind barbed wires based only on his looks. And they said, please, please run with it. I'd like to read something that Rod wrote um, for this. It was an indescribable high in 2002 to have the honor of carrying the Olympic flame as a free person on its way to the state of Utah, the place where I had spent my first years of life behind barbed wire especially when I received waves from a group of Native Americans along the route. They understood the significance of what I was doing. Not only was I running for the school children of my home communities, but I was running for all AJAs whose patriotism had been questioned during the dark days following Pearl Harbor. You talked about the darkness mm -hmm. in part of your father's life. Did that darkness manifest itself in any way that you could see? Um, yes, it did. In fact, even though he was really gregarious and had a lot of friends and all, he struck me as very distant sometimes and, and hard, even as a son who was really close to him, it's really hard to get very, very close to him. For example, it was almost impossible to dis discuss personal things with him. I could talk to my mother but I couldn't talk to him. I couldn't ask him about really difficult things about the camp. And for example, I'd always ask him, well, what did you feel when your mother left your family? And he would me change the subject. In a Japanese society, you don't bellyache, you don't complain. So you keep it to yourself and you become very stoic. And so he was very similar to a lot of the other Nisei men I know, that they could never open up their feelings and share things with you. Um, and that's why when the camp redress came around, that was the first time for a lot of them to actually begin to talk about that. Because I remember he started crying when redress. And you know, he never used to cry. He was, you know, a samurai doesn't cry. He used to always tell me, a samurai does not cry. A samurai does not bellyache. And why I did he that. Why did he cry when redress was passed? I <laughs> um, even though he, okay, even though he says we're Americans, we're proud to be Americans, we're patriotic, we're good YMCA, or Christians, there was always that feeling that somehow you weren't as good as the rest. You were suspicious, you were hated for one, right? You were not respected. There's all those feelings, right, that aren't expressed. And he never told me about those. But I knew, because I said to him many times, I said, I would have been really angry. And he said, you know, well, you didn't grow up during that period of time, so you wouldn't understand. But I said, but didn't you feel anything when you were being put down, you were being hated, distrusted, being thrown in the camp? Didn't it really get you angry or something? And he would say, well, you know, and then go back to the Christian things, it is better to light a candle. And sometimes I said, well, that's nice, except sometimes injustice is injustice, and you have to show it. You returned to Topaz in 1993 with your son and your young grandson. Well, we're back here to the desert of Topaz, where we were 50 years ago. Lots of memories out here in the desert. Lots of ghosts of the past. And yet, now we can say that we are laying 
the ghosts away. We are closing a chapter in our memory of Topaz. What kind of an experience was that? Uh, it was very, well, it's, I, t I took video, and I think one of the finest uh, shot is of my son, Rod, and his son. At that time, I guess he was eight or 10 years old. And I took a, a video while they were talking to each other, walking through the desert. And I think that's a classic. I think that should be used someday for, uh, he's telling all about the war, about the camp, and all that to his young son. And they're walking together in the desert. We've seen here, in fact, all the diaries your father kept. Right. And he documented everything, just <laughs> yeah. about everything Every in his life. <laughs> yes, yes. And he kept everything. Mm -hmm. Why did he do that? Well, well, I mean, he was an inveterate collector, and he, he just told me all, on at the very beginning, he gave, someone gave him a diary just to, you know, put things down. And, and a lot of kids get diaries, but they quit after a couple of weeks, right? But there was something about my father, I think because he had this sense of history, he knew that what he was going through was historic in nature. Even when he was shooting all those home movies, he said, it's just home movies, this is family. But he also knew that in the bigger context of what was going on in the world, in the United States, he knew everything he took was of historic value. So I think that a lot of that sense of history and the sense of the importance of, of witnessing what was going on and even if you couldn't express it publicly, I think a lot of that public outrage was basically kind of like funneled into his writing and his note taking saying, even if I can't say it, someday the record will show that this happened. Someday, a hundred years from now when I'm gone, they'll see the camp pictures, right? And so I think that was his way of saying, I was here, I was a witness, I'm somebody, we were mistreated, and this is what the truth was. Tell me about your dad's movie, Topaz Memories, being accepted by the Library of Congress's film registry. Yes, it was um, actually nominated in 1996 by Karen Ishizuka from the Japanese American National Museum, where dad had originally donated the original film. 25 film from American filmdom, cinema, are inducted out of a thousand every year that are nominated. And in that year, Dad's was one of the 25. It was big news in Hollywood. Uh, one of my, my uh, actually high school buddies uh, was a VP of business development at Columbia Pictures. And the day it hit the news and the variety and Hollywood Reporter, he called me up, he said, are you related to Dave Tatsang? I goes, that's my dad. He goes, Big news, everybody is looking over the list because they all want to get onto the big list um, you know, from the Library of Congress because you have Casablanca, Gone to the Wind, all the famous movies. And you know, a badge of honor in Hollywood is to get onto that list. And my dad made it. Your dad received many honors from organizations throughout his life. Uh, what was the most meaningful to him? Probably the thousand mile swim at the YMCA where it was a swimathon for fundraising for the Y, and Dad, every lunch hour for I don't know how many years, would swim a quarter mile to keep in shape and work off his stress, and basically to be in the water again. They had the scuba thon for him, basically, and he swam the thousand miles. That was the most meaningful, you think? I think so, for him, mm -hmm. outside of any others, you know, other mm -hmm. honor. Even outside the Library of Congress honor? Yes. Mm -hmm. Really? Why, why, why is that? It was him alone. It's something he chose to do, to mm -hmm. keep in shape. Every single day, he was at the Y, and then he'd mm -hmm. come home for half a sandwich and go back to the store. So it was like a personal accomplishment. Yeah, mm -hmm. personal accomplishment. Mm -hmm. yeah. So th this is the camera that your yes. father used Absolutely. to shoot Topaz Memories in, in the camp. Yes, it is. Yeah. What do you plan to do with this camera now? Well, for now, we get to show it like this and display it and enjoy it. One day it will belong to the American people. Just like his film. Just like his film, yes.
Funding for the production of Dave Tatsuno Movies and Memories has been provided by the Henry and Tomoe Takahashi Charitable Foundation and the members of KTEH.